Hiking in the cold rain without an umbrella is supposed to make you sick. That's a lie. Obviously, the common cold comes from a virus, not from humidity and cold. Besides, there are a lot of other worse things that can happen, obviously. Maybe that's why my parents get so hung up on telling kids the common cold comes from raindrops. Maybe if my parents had told me the truth, I wouldn't have gone hiking even though there was rain in the forecast. It started out as an overcast evening with a red sky, the kind of pretty sky I'd want to watch from the top of a hiking trail. It was my usual path, perfect to see beautiful sunsets and nature. At the base were some tall trees, though for the life of me, I couldn't identify them. Brown trees with green leaves, in the summer at least. The further I went up the mountain, the deeper a green the leaves seemed. Maybe it was because the color actually changed. More likely, it was because the trees somehow grew denser the further up we went. There was a period midway through the mountain when the trees were so tall and overbearing that the sky was completely obliterated. Naturally, this was the part of the mountain I was always the most afraid to climb, though I largely kept that to myself. What self-respecting adult would admit they were afraid of a little dark patch? I would just walk through at a faster pace, trying hard not to twist my ankles. That day, the hike started as it usually did. Lovely sights, tall trees, and a sun that was just about to set. Beautiful. After about 20 minutes, I got the sense that someone was behind me. You know, when your sixth sense kicks in, and it's like you feel another living soul in the vicinity before you see or hear them. I wasn't worried. This was a common trail with several other hikers that I routinely ran into. Maybe it was time to say hello to whoever was behind me. But turning my head, I couldn't see another person. Shivers started to run up and down my spine. It's just, it almost looked like a shadow would evaporate every time I tried to look at it. It was probably nothing, or so I tried to tell myself. Why would I miss out on a beautiful hike over nothing? It started to rain. I kept walking. Water started to get in my eyes, piercing them stinging slightly. Were those footsteps I heard behind me? Or was it the rain falling? Finally, a twig snapped. It wasn't the rain. I was about to head into the part where the trees blocked out the sky. This was it. No, this was too much. Enough was enough. It was time I turned around and go home. An old woman blocked my path, doing nothing except staring at me. She might have looked like another hiker, except she looked so ragged, almost like she was dragged through the muddy riverbed, covered with seaweed dangling off her shoulders. Her skin was white, and her teeth in her ever-opening mouth were sharp. Despite the rain pushing her hair down, it actually reached up towards the sky, almost like tendrils reaching up to grab at prey. One lashed out towards me, cutting my forearm on the downstroke, marking me with a bright red cut that glistened before the blood was washed to the ground by the rain. I had no choice but to run onward, up the mountain, under the canopy of dark trees. At least if I ran that way, I might find people on the other side, right? I ran as quickly as I could, through the dark forest, not even looking back to see if she was following me. It didn't matter that after a few mere moments, my muscles were burning from running uphill, or that I tripped and fell three times, because the ground was sopping wet from the rain. Nothing mattered, except that I keep running. Finally, once I reached the other end, I turned around. The old woman was nowhere to be seen, 
and I felt safe enough to collapse next to the river momentarily. There was a little bit of sunshine coming down from the top of the mountain, where the sun was finally piercing through the trees. Maybe I'd get to see that sunset after all. I was wrong. A hand with sharp nails grabbed my ankle, and I pulled myself up to see the old woman coming out of the river, teeth sharp, pulling me under the water. Help! I screamed. Was there anyone around who would hear me? Water filled my lungs as my head was submerged beneath the little waves going down the mountain. I flailed, trying to grab at anything I could. This was how I was going to die. A sea witch was going to drown me. A sharp pain came from my ankle as I felt her teeth chomp down, breaking my skin. A strong current pushed me down the river so forcefully, I hit my head on one of the rocks at either the bottom or the top of the lake. Space, up, down, and any sense of orientation had fully left me, and so had my consciousness. When I finally woke up, I was at the bottom of the mountain. The current had brought me the length of the river, where a friendly family had found me, and phoned the paramedics. As they loaded me into the ambulance, they gently chastised me for hiking alone, for being reckless, for playing next to the river. Fine, I couldn't tell them what really happened anyway, so I nodded as if I agreed their advice was good. It was a blessing when they hooked me up to some morphine. My eyes drifted over my body and the bruises and cuts I had acquired. Oh, my knee was damaged. Almost like something strong had bitten down on it. The sea witch's teeth. I must have been unconscious for days. Waking up was extremely disorienting. Especially when I woke up that time in the middle of the night and had to go to the bathroom. I got my IV bag and went to the bathroom myself. Too self-conscious to call for a nurse if it wasn't necessary. When I went to wash my hands, I was so tired I just let the water run in the sink for a while over my hands. Looking in the mirror, I was taken aback by how ragged my face looked after this ordeal. Unable to look at my face any longer, I looked down at my hands, and I noticed through the sink a long black tendril, just like the old woman's hair, coming through the opening of the sink. Panicking, I ran out of the bathroom, alarming all the nurses on the floor. Since that day in the hospital, I've had many mental health practitioners tell me I was just imagining it, and prescribing me drugs to help with hallucinations. But all I know is the only surefire way to avoid the woman is to avoid large bodies of water, including the sewer systems. It's the only reason I live in a house with no running water, and I work from home, avoiding offices and people as much as possible. For drinking even, I need to make a long trek to the well. Sometimes, when I shine my flashlight down, her form might be at the very bottom, staring back up at me. Luckily, she can't climb up the well. So I rub the mark on my forearm and go about my somewhat less than whole life. I always knew it was a secluded place to go camping. That's how we liked it, with no one around. My friend Jonathan and I always joked that it was the ideal place to get murdered. Again, we joked. The two of us had a little corner of the forest we liked to go to. It was far enough away from the hiking trail we didn't have the sounds of obnoxious university students going on their first hiking trip. It was close enough to the river we could go and get good clean water, swim, and go fishing. How was it no one had discovered this spot yet? Probably because the path there was treacherous. Terribly treacherous. Jonathan and I discovered it by accident a couple of years ago when we were going hiking and got tired of the usual path. It was just too loud. 
It started out just wandering away from the main path so we could hear one another speak. It ended with us completely lost, and needing to change the batteries in our GPS to find our way back. But then, once we had the batteries in, and it was ready to go, we decided to stay overnight. We didn't want to leave. A beautiful little nook in nature, secluded, private, and ripe with inappropriate jokes about death. Just the sort of thing Jonathan would joke about. He always had this look about him, like he'd attract trouble. I think that's how Riley found us. We were sitting at the fire, roasting marshmallows and hot dogs. Jonathan always put marshmallows on the hot dogs, which I thought was disgusting. We were in the middle of a playful argument about his taste buds and how he must be pregnant to find all that delicious. Hello, we heard from behind us. With a start, we turned around to see Riley standing there. He was about our age, with a five o'clock shadow and a heavy camouflage jacket, the kind serious hunters wore. At the time, Jonathan's and my eyes drifted towards the slick black crossbow that was slung over his shoulder. He told us he was cold, which we believed, of course, because his hair seemed wet and his skin looked pale. Jonathan looked like he was about to tell Riley a lie about us leaving soon, but I cut in. I wasn't exactly scared Riley was going to shoot us in the pack with the crossbow. But I didn't want to turn my back on him, just in case. He sat down right next to me. There was something off about him, though at the time neither Jonathan and I could put our fingers on it. We offered him some of our food and beer, thinking he might be hungry. Only he turned down everything and just kept talking. He told us about the girl he was dating back in the city, his job as an accountant, and his passion for going on hunting trips. He told us he had lost his friends, though when we offered to let him use our cell phone, he turned it down. Have you ever tried fresh deer meat? He asked. Jonathan and I shook our heads and continued to listen politely. Overall, Riley seemed simple enough, though again there was something off about him. Eventually, Riley told us he had to go meet his friends. The way he said it sounded nice enough, though later on in the tent, Jonathan and I debated leaving or relocating the campsite. But that just sounded more dangerous with the alleged hunters looking for fresh deer meat. Safer to stay put. We managed to survive the night and didn't see Riley or his friends when we woke up. Quietly, Jonathan and I packed up and drove back to the city. We didn't have enough time to eat, so we stopped at a gas station along the way to top off the tank. Inside the shop, my eyes drifted towards the missing persons wall. Immediately, my eyes noticed a familiar picture. I must have been standing there for a while because the gas station attendant arrived and asked me what I was looking at. Right there on the wall in front of me was a picture of Riley. My hands, shaking slightly, moved up and pointed at the old looking photograph. The gas station attendant seemed a little flustered as she reached over and took Riley's picture off. This isn't supposed to be here, she said before she told me. Riley was pronounced dead a year ago after what was eventually ruled as a hunting accident when he was out with his friends. There was just the way about how she put accident in air quotations that put me on edge. Where we were really was the best place to get murdered. It went without saying, Jonathan and I never went back there again. And it wasn't long before we put a Google alert every time someone shared a story about Riley. Even years later, people claimed they saw Riley, the man in camouflage, with a crossbow, who would just sit and talk at the campfire. Was it someone playing a practical joke? Was he someone who looked like Riley? Or was it the actual dead man come back to life? Most importantly, did he ever find his friends? <laughs>